and over and over again. Amen? Amen. If you're visiting with us this morning, we'd like to welcome you and encourage you in the Lord this morning. We do teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so we'll be continuing our, our, our teaching this morning in 2 Corinthians. But if you have your bulletins, if you'll open those to the inside and stand with me as we read our scripture verses together this morning. Today we will be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. So let's begin. Remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor the things which they affirm. You may be seated this morning, and we dismiss our children for Children's Church today. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as we continue our study. You know, we do, need to, uh, we do need to see if we can reach out and get more boys to come to the, to the children's church. Uh, we have an all-girls children's church right now, which is, which is awesome. We're, whatever God brings us, we're happy. Amen? Amen? Well, last week, chapter 10 in 2 Corinthians, and we saw Paul addressing those men who've come into the church and they stir up strife and they stir up division. And we're going to be covering a lot more of that this week. As a matter of fact, this particular uh, section here of 2 Corinthians, Paul is addressing these false teachers, if you will. The majority of the message last week focused on verses 3 through 6 in chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. If you didn't have the opportunity to uh, hear last week's message, I encourage you to to do so. It was such a, a powerful message as these verses came to life, seeing that uh, they line up with Ephesians chapter 6 and the, and the armor of God and how those two are so closely related because we know we can't fight spiritual battles with our minds. We can't fight it with our flesh. We can't fight it with the, with the weapons of, of the natural realm. We have to, have to go to the Lord. We have to have Him. And what we really saw is that we clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ. We clothe ourselves in Him. And when we do that, that's what the armor of God actually is. And our plans and our schemes and positive mental attitudes, self-help, self-help courses and books, they can't win a war. They can't win a war against spiritual forces in heavenly places. And our only chance is to clothe ourselves in His armor, knowing that we clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our strength. He fights the battles for us as He did for David and when he went to, to war with Goliath as he did with Jehoshaphat, as the three nations came against him. And God told them, he said, the battle is not yours, the battle is mine. And that's how we have to continue to understand. If we're walking in the Spirit, and we're not walking in the flesh, then what we know is that God has the battle. But we need to make sure that we submit ourselves to him, clothe ourselves in him, walk out the battle in the spiritual realm, not in the fleshly realm. And all we need to do is to trust in Him, believe in Him, and submit to Him, never forgetting that we're completely dependent upon Him. And I think that that is one of the things that that we struggle with the most sometimes. We get a a victor in our lives, and we're, we're excited, we're thankful, we're excited in the Lord, but then somewhere along the line, we get that little mindset, wow, I won that battle. And the next thing we know... 
we're not completely dependent upon Him in our thought process and the next battle comes and then we're right back in that same place. Lord, why? What? When? Where? What's going on? And God reminds us the battle's not yours, it's mine. You need to be totally focused on me, totally dependent upon me, totally walking out in relationship with me. And that's where we find our hope. That's where we find our peace in the midst of the battles. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. We hear part of that scripture quoted many times. Just resist the devil, and he's going to flee from you. Well, if you're not submitted to God, the devil's not going anywhere when you resist him because you can't resist him in your own strength. You have to submit to God first. And that's the whole focus of what the relationship with God is all about. Now, this week we begin chapter, two, uh, chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. And our title this week is, What is in Your Resume? What is in your resume? Father, we ask that you will open our ears this morning. Ask that you will... Speak to our hearts, speak to our bodies and our minds, and just, Lord, fill us with all that you have for us today so that we walk away today at rest, at peace, but also, Lord, knowing that we have the written word on our hearts that we can carry, Lord. And when the enemy does come, we can call upon that word, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we stand in your word. We love your word, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul is changing his tone here as we move into this section of his writing. And while we'll get to the main point, of this letter, which is the defense of his calling and his ministry, he first asked them, he said, allow with me just a little bit of folly, okay? Allow with me just a little bit here as, as, as we are boasting, they're boasting, and he's speaking about all of the other uh, teachers and false prophets that have raised themselves up in their own witness, in their own testimony, and they're, they're saying basically, hey, look at us, and they're boasting in who they are. And so Paul says, allow me just a little bit of folly here. Um, and that's, that's a little bit of boasting. Since after all, they owe him that. And Paul says, you owe me this opportunity to boast just a little bit. Since Paul was the one who came to them. Paul was the one who planted the church. He's the one that preached the gospel. And for those who believed, they were betrothed to Christ as his bride. And all through Scripture, we see the church described as the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, and as believers, husbands and wives have seen this scripture many times. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And Paul says it with that... It's with a godly jealousy. He's jealous over the people here. He's saying, I'm jealous because you guys are turning away from the one of whom I taught you about, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're, you're, you're now being sucked in by these other teachers, these other people who are not grounded on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so I'm jealous for you in that. I'm jealous because you should be focused on Jesus. You should be locked in in that relationship. You shouldn't be even listening to these other people. But you are. And so I'm, I'm, a jeal I'm jealous here. I have this, this godly jealousy because you are committed as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. Why, therefore, are you looking elsewhere? And these false teachers who've infiltrated infiltr the church are evidently, they're causing some to stray from the gospel of the truth. And Paul's jealousy is to let them know that they need to get back to the foundation 
of Jesus Christ. And remember back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we looked at it, it says in verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So to entertain any other ideas... To drift away in, in your mind, philosophies, or any other gospels that might be out there, if it's not about Jesus Christ, if it's not grounded in the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then basically that causes people to no longer be the chaste virgin of Jesus Christ. And the truth is, to do this, to allow your mind, to allow false teaching, to allow worldly wisdom... To allow anything to entertain your thought process other than the foundation of Jesus Christ, it causes us to actually prostitute ourselves. And that's a harsh, harsh statement. That's a harsh teaching. But the word backs it up. In the book of Hosea, God illustrates how Israel has prostituted themselves by turning away from the Lord and practicing idolatry. Hosea chapter 4, 11 through 12 says, Harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. That's how God views those who and follow after something else besides Him, besides His true heart, besides Jesus Christ. It's no different for us today. There's so many regurgitated lies out there. And I say regurgitated because there's nothing new under the sun. That's what Ecclesiastes tells us. It's all repackaged. It's all presented in a different way. But it's all based in the same lie from the enemy. And it's all out there. It's repackaged throughout the generations. But no matter what is presented, no matter how pretty the bow is on the package, no matter how pretty the wrapping is, no matter what you see on the outside, it's still rotten on the inside. It's rotten on the inside because it brings death. Only Jesus brings life. Only Jesus brings life. Anything added to it takes away. You don't need anything added to Jesus. You don't need anything to substitute Jesus. You don't need anything to be taught to you that breaks you away from your relationship with Jesus. You have to walk out that relationship with Jesus Christ, inside and outside. And Satan has not changed his tactics from the very beginning. He's a deceiver. And one way he deceives today more than any other way is in our education system, in the, in the way that we process information, in the way that we learn. Satan is an expert at twisting things just a little bit, bringing just a little bit of doubt a little bit of confusion, a little bit of, well, that sort of made sense, thought process, to the point to where then we start investigating worldly and ungodly ways of trying to explain a spiritual being. You cannot explain God, not in the natural terms. The, the greatest words, the greatest uh, and articulate uh, package that you can put together to try to describe God falls so far short of who God actually is. Because God is above our ways. He's above our thoughts. And He doesn't speak in the language, in the spiritual language, the way that we understand, except when we have the Holy Spirit. And except when we have the Word. And then when He speaks, we hear and we know. And it may not line up with common sense all the time. And it may not line up with anything that you're hearing in the world. And it may not line up to the political correctness that we're being taught every single day. But it lines up to our hearts because the Word of God becomes alive within us. It is a living Word. Sharper than any two-edged sword. And the living Word comes and it lives in our hearts. And it reveals truth. And it reveals who we are in Him. And that truth is what we depend upon. And what Paul is saying here, he is saying, listen, he said... This, you've received this. He even talked to them about the gifts of the Holy Spirit earlier on in chapter 1 as we went through in chapter 12. And he said, You even know and understand what it means to operate in the spiritual gifts. So they had all of that at their disposal. The Holy Spirit was alive in the church. And yet, 
they were still struggling with people coming in and it up and saying, well, that may not be exactly what that means. Or maybe they were coming in and saying, oh, disregard Paul. Come on, look, he doesn't even speak good. He don't have good language skills. He's not a good articulate person. Look at us. We, can, we, we, we put our words together really well. Well, I put my words together really well. They just don't come out by the time I try to say them. I've got them all written down nice. And I even sometimes I'll go over a word and I will hyphenate it out so I'll get it so I can pronounce it right. And it still doesn't come out right when I speak it. And I praise God for that because I hope it's the message that you're hearing, not necessarily the way that I put it out there. Because it is the word. It is the message. And that's what we want. We don't need to be the best of the best. We need to be the most submitted of the submitted. That's who we need to be in Christ. Verses 3 through 4, Paul continues, he says, But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from this simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity that is in Christ. Such a key aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The simplicity that's in Christ. For he who comes preaches another Jesus from whom we've not preached. Or if you receive a different spirit for which you've not received. Or a different gospel which you've not accepted. Well, you may well put up with it. In other words, what he's saying is he said, you are kind of allowing these guys to do what they're doing. They're preaching another gospel. They're not walking out according to the foundation of Jesus Christ. They're not walking. The Spirit's not right. Nothing is right in what they're saying, but you well put up with it. So Paul is actually bringing a rebuke, a rebuke to them by saying, look, can you not see? What is, what is your... What do you measure truth by? And this is such an important part of we as believers, we have to have a measuring stick. We have to have a yardstick. We have to have something that we can look to to say, this is our standard. Anything other than this is wrong. And people will say, well, wow, that's awful close-minded. You sure are close-minded. Why? How can you say that? Look at all that is out here. Can you honestly say that this little bitty bubble of what you say is truth, is truth when all this other stuff is out there? Well, yes, we can. Why? Because Jesus said, narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Do we want to walk in destruction or do we want to walk in wisdom? Do we want to walk in truth? So Paul is saying you need to recognize this and you need to take a stand against it. Why is it so hard for us to receive the simplicity of the gospel for what it is. Why is it so difficult for us to just accept it? Accept it. And quite honestly, I believe it's because men throughout the years have muddied the waters. They've tried to explain things in human terms. They've tried to put it all out there and say, well, we've got the answers and this is what all this really means. And they use human wisdom to try to define those things sometimes rather than coming to Christ as a child. Come to Christ as a child. That's what Jesus told us to do in Matthew 18.3. He said, And assuredly I say to you, unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, we've had this illustration before, but how does a child in, engage with his parents or her parents? Arms open wide. They run to mom. They run to dad. They scrape their knee. They usually run to mom, but not always. They run to dad too. Their arms are open. Their hearts are open. They don't understand the world around them. They don't understand when mom and dad says, now this is hot, don't touch. But at the same time, they understand that their mom and dad know what they're talking about. Well, that's my mom and dad. They know. They know. And do children make mistakes? Absolutely they do. They may touch that hot thing. But then they, what do they do? They run back to mom and dad. <laughs> You're right. That hurts. <laughs> but there's, there's just a, a, a willingness to run to, to mom and dad. It's a willingness to, to just be open and to receive what they say, 
Now, we also know that the child has rebelliousness, and they want to test the waters, and they want to push against. Does that sound familiar? If you have children, you know that. Well, then go look in the mirror, because God says the same thing about us. We want to push back. We want to push back. Well, God, surely, oh, come on, it's not that big of a deal. I want to have a little fun. I want to go out and, you know, blah, blah. And God says, I would rather you spend time with me. If you spend time with me, you'll find protection. You spend time with me, guarded. You spend time with me, you'll understand that even though that seems like a good time, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Don't go there. We need to come to him as a little child. We need to receive his truth as a little child. But it's when we try to move out of the realm of childlike faith. It's when we try to decide on our own and process with our own minds and say, well, I think I can understand this. I think what this means is this and this and that. And you start putting it all together. That's when God will shake it up. And you'll realize that, well, I didn't quite know as much as I thought I knew. And he would reveal that to us. But when we think we have the spiritual answers, that's when the enemy has access to trip us up. When we think we've got all the answers. He'll deceive us with craftiness, and it plays on our fleshly, finite minds because when our finite minds decide we understand something that God has not revealed to us, the enemy takes that, and he will run with it. And the next thing you know, you're flat on your face before the Lord, saying, Lord, what happened? I thought I understood this. I thought I had this. This was, you know. But the enemy will play it, and he will, he will manipulate that in our minds. And he'll stir up our adult pride from the childhood faith. And he'll harden our childlike hearts. He'll cause us to doubt. He'll cause us to entertain false teaching and our quest for knowledge for him. And that's how the enemy works. If you're in the flesh desiring everything about God and desiring that you're going to figure it all out in your mind, Satan will come in there and he will twist that up. He'll pump you up. He'll make you feel really good about everything you know. And then, bam, you're on the floor and you're questioning God. Why? And God says, because you didn't seek me in the Spirit. You sought me in the flesh. You sought to know about me. The only way you're going to know God and not just about God is to spend time with him. Stay in His Word. Stay in prayer. Remain Spirit-led. Let God do the work in you. 1 Corinthians 4, 5-6 through 6 says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring light to the things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. That none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. Now what he was really in, in context speaking about was is the Corinthians were all building one person above the other. In their minds, Paul is the guy we have to follow, not Apollos. No, no, no. No, we've got to follow Apollos. No, no, no. We don't. No, it's this guy. It's that guy. And Paul said, no, you've already puffed yourselves up. And in pride, you're saying you know the one you need to follow above the other. And he said, it's not about that. We all serve the same God. We are nothing but ministers and servants of the same God. Some waters, some feed, some do this, some do that. But we're all in the foundation of Jesus Christ. So it's Him you should be worshiping. It's Him you should be following. Don't put one above the other. And this is where pride comes in. And it's because what happens is, and this is where it really gets ugly, is when the people begin to do that, then the ones of whom they're following begin to receive that. And the next thing you know, well, yeah, I think actually I do have a little bit more knowledge and intellect than brother so-and-so does, and I think I do teach better, and I... In their minds, they may not say it openly, but they start thinking this way. And the next thing you know, you've got a whole group of division. Because one has been puffed up and others are following that. We have to see what Paul is telling us here. When we get beyond what is written, we get divisive. We get divisive. And division is rooted in pride. Believing that you have the correct answer and all others are wrong. And once this happens, we become puffed up and we become unteachable. You become unteachable when you think you know it all. 
God says, you don't know it all. <laughs> Let me teach you. Let me encourage you. Let me show you truth. Get in my word. Spend time in my word. And the church is littered with this very thing. Denominations, which the word means divide or division. It proves this very point. And beyond that, beyond the level of denominations, because there are many that have little things that separate them and they, they have different groups that they worship in, but it goes beyond that when they start taking other things that are not even in God's Word and they start applying that and the next thing you know, you have no boundaries, you have no foundation, you have no standard, you have a cult. And that's where cults come from. It's taking a little truth, mixing in a lot of lies, convincing a lot of people, and you have a lot of division and a lot of hurt and a lot of evil that comes along with that. So Paul now begins to address these false teachers. He's going to be addressing them directly. First, he reminds them of how he handled himself when he came to the church. How did he, how did he handle himself when he came? Well, we know it was never about Paul. He never made it about himself. He always made it about Jesus. His heart was for the Lord. His heart was for the people. Unlike these other false teachers, their heart is about themselves. Verses 5 through 9. He says, For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted, because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you, and indeed I was a burden to no one, for what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. If anyone could stand on his own merit, Paul could. If there was any man that we can even compare among other men, Paul was one that could stand on his own merit. While he may not have been the most eloquent in speech, as he said, he didn't have that, that gift, but he wasn't lacking in knowledge. He made up for it in knowledge. Acts 22.3 says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but I brought up in this city of the feet of Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was one of the most prominent teachers of the law of Paul's day. He sat under him. Educational-wise, there was not many that compared to what Paul received in his education. He was taught according to the strictness of our fathers and law and was zealous toward God as you are all today. This was who Paul was. This is his background. He was a very knowledgeable man. And I believe that because of his vast understanding of the law, that there's no doubt that he was one of the greatest apologists of all times. He knew the foundation of the law, and then he knew Jesus, who fulfilled the law. And he understood the fulfillment of what Jesus did in the fullness of such things. And so, therefore, he was the greatest apologist of all time. And this is proven in all of his writings. You can have the best education, but as Paul has shown us over and over it's not what you know. It's who you know. Now, that's a term that we use today in the business world a lot. You know, people who go out and looking for jobs. It's not what you know, it's who you know. You know, you, if you know so-and-so, they can refer you to so-and-so. And that does happen a lot. If you have connections, you can get jobs sometimes easier than filling out an application or sending your resume and doing all of those things. But the fact of the matter is, in this case, the absolute bottom line truth is, it's not what you know. It's not what you've been taught. It's who you know. It's Jesus Christ. Because what you should be, be taught is rooted and grounded in Him. And when you know Him, you know what you're being taught is true. Or, you know when you're not being taught truth. You have a check in your spirit. Something doesn't line up. Something's not right. And it's also... Paul will tell us it's not how well you present. You can walk away with the best in show award. <laughs> and a lot of people have it. The best in show award. But it all comes down to wisdom. 
It comes down to discernment. It comes down to understanding. And it comes down to knowing that only God can provide that. Only God can provide that. You don't need to rehearse before God. You don't need to rehearse your message and practice it and make sure the jokes are right where they're supposed to be and make sure that everything is exactly as it should be. Oh, that's a wonderful performance. And if you want to go to a performance, then go. I mean, there's many out there. There's a lot of places you want to go and you want to see, and you want to see their act right. You know, you want to see them on their game. But when you come before the Lord, it shouldn't be about somebody being on their game. It should be somebody about who submitted their game before the Lord and allow God to do the work through them, allow God to do the work in us. So that as we leave today, it's not just about hearing a wonderful performed message, but it's about going out and saying, I heard the word and I want it in my heart. I want it applied today and I want to be able to let that flow through me on Monday morning. Because you can't always show up with the best game. And if you're a Georgia fan, you know what I'm talking about. So far, they haven't shown up at all. They just got lucky three games out of four. But the point I'm making here is that we need to always submit ourselves before the Lord. Submit ourselves before the Lord. Trust in Him. Allow His Word to penetrate our heart. Allow His Word to grow us. Allow that relationship to be the most important thing. 1 Corinthians 1, 19-21 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring it to nothing, the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. You can't present God in a worldly way. And you can't put the world into the church. You can't mix the two. They don't blend. They don't work. You've got to separate yourself. And we as believers have to be guarded of those who would come in and try to mix in false teaching, mix in other things that are not grounded in the Word of God. And it's through this wisdom that Paul says he was fully manifested in all things regarding his call. He was fully manifested in all things regarding his call and in his authority. Unlike these eminent apostles, they were all about themselves. Paul didn't come to get. He came to give. He came to pour out, not to receive and and hold in. He made it a point to not burden the church in Corinth. His needs were met through other means. And he trusted God for those means, day in and day out. Either the other churches or, in some case, him working with his own hands. As a tent maker, he provided whatever needed to be done at the time. And Paul didn't go out and charge them for his service. He didn't go out and say, bring out your checkbooks and then we're going to preach. He went out and said, Lord, I am your servant. I'm going to give what you call me to give. And in turn, you will provide what I need when I need it. And because of that, he was able to say, I have learned to be content in all things. I've learned to be content when I have much. I've learned to be content when I have little. I've learned to be content in my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's all we need. That's all we need. Paul's work wasn't a job. It was a calling. And there's a difference. There's a difference. If you feel that God is calling you to do something, you have a desire within you that the Holy Spirit is placed and He's growing in you and He's going to lead you into that and He's going to provide for you what you need when you need it. And you won't be going into that call saying, okay, well, this is where God's called me and I'm excited about doing this, but we've got to work out the details. How much are you going to pay me first? That's not biblical. We should never go in on the front end expecting what we're going to get out of it. We should go in and say, if God's called, He will provide. And that's something that Calvary Chapel has used, I think that phrase, many, many, many years, where God guides, He provides. 
Because he does. He provides. He's never, ever lacking what we need. And if Paul understood this, he made sure that the church was not indebted to him. And after reminding him of these things, Paul shifts, his, shifts from the defense mode to offense. <laughs> he's now on the offensive line, and he's about to push back, verses 10 through 15. He says, As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So I'd say the gloves are off now. <laughs> He's called them out. They're false apostles. They're false prophets. And he says it's no great thing if Satan's ministers, meaning these people, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Paul not only declares that they're, they're just not just merely pretenders to claim that they're just like Paul and all the other apostles. He said it's beyond that. They're not just pretenders. That's pretty much what they are, but they're pretenders with a purpose. They're, they're going deeper here, and they're presenting themselves as something that they're not. And Paul calls them out, and he says that, that they're false apostles, deceitful workers. And it sounds to me like what these guys are doing is this beginning of the works doctrine, if you will. He's presenting to the church, you know, look at what we're doing. And if you do these things, and you do and you work, and blah, 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 you're going to be blessed. And that's not what this is about. You can't make yourself anything in the kingdom of God. These men were pretending to be something they weren't. They felt like they got out there and they put on a good performance, and they convinced the people, they deceived the people then they can make themselves, because it says they are trying to transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness. That's the lie. That's not who they are. Well, that's what the works doctrine does. The works doctrine tells you, you go out and you work for it, and you can make yourself whatever you want to be, and you can do these things, and that's not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you submit yourself unto God, you come to Him, you surrender yourself, you don't try to make yourself something in the kingdom of God. If you try to make yourself something in the kingdom of God, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's Jesus who makes anything out of any of us. It's that relationship. It's the love of God. It's the blood that covers our sins and transforms us from our belief in who He is from death to life. It's all about Him. You can't pretend. You can't make yourself. You can't work at it. You can't do anything. To make yourself righteous. Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Jesus said, he came and he spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. If it doesn't come from Jesus, then it's not real. He's the only one with the authority. It says, all authority was given to him. Now, if all authority is given to him, then all authority in our lives is given by him. Not on our own. Nothing we can make, nothing we can earn, nothing we can do. Luke ten nineteen says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All authority comes from Jesus to us. It's from Him. We can't do anything on our own. We can't make it happen. A call of God is not a learned or even a chosen trade. Now you may say, well, 
You're talking about a call of God. Are you talking about a preacher? Are you talking about a minister? Are you talking about a teacher? Are you talking about someone doing something? Yeah, I'm talking about all of those things, but I'm also talking about individuals who want to be what God's called them to be. The call of God is upon your heart to be obedient to Him in the day-in and day-out things, wherever you work, wherever you go, wherever you travel, whatever you do. You're to be submitted to God in that calling. And in that calling, you submit it to Him. And in that calling, you say, Lord, you will provide in whatever I need in this call of what you've placed me to do. And that's for everyone. It's not just for those who appear to be in authority. It's for everyone who is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a call on our hearts to submit to Him. And even before we meet Him, that call, is long, it's long, we have a longing, an emptiness. We don't always know what that is. Some people try to fill it with, with relationships. Some fill it with work, money. Some fill it with, with one person after the other or one thing after the other. Uh, I know people who, they get so excited about a trip. They get so excited about a birthday. They get so excited about an event. And when it comes, it's like a... They're down. They're out. Because it never met the expectation of what they assumed it was going to be. But in Christ, in that call on our heart, the longing that we have, we find peace in Him. We find the joy in Him. We find the contentment in Him. And therefore, none of the other stuff is put in play anymore. We're no longer looking for something. We know the someone who's going to fill that in our hearts. And that call, it's not learned. And it's not a chosen trait. It's given from Jesus Christ Himself. The call of God can only come from Him and those, he's, those He chooses. So all of these false teachers were not from Him, but from Satan Himself. And Paul pointed out that they're not only doing what Satan does, masquerading as something that they're not. These are the same thing that the leaders of Israel were doing when Jesus walked through and called them out. In John 8.44 he told them this, he said, you're the father of the devil, or your father is of the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And these were the scribes and Pharisees he's talking to. These were the leaders of Israel. And he's calling them children of the devil. And he goes on to say, and from the beginning he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So false teachers, people who drift away from the foundation of Jesus Christ, people who build themselves up as something that they're not, they're children of the devil. And we as believers need to be alert. We need to be awake. We need to stay in the Word. We need to be submitting to the Spirit in order to not be taken in by the outward appearances of polished performances. Verses 16 through 20. I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many boast of flesh, I will also boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourself are wise. For you put up with it if one bonded, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. To our shame, I say that we're too weak for that. <laughs> I love that. Paul said, we're too weak to slap you in the face. We're too weak to take from you. We're too weak to do all of those things. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am also bold. So he tells them now, he says, if these men can boast in their pretentiousness, I can also boast. But what Paul boasts in is not pretentiousness. It's actuality. Everything Paul boasted in actually were about what happened to him, his sufferings that he endured. In verse 20, Paul gives us more detail on what these false prophets were doing and how the church put up. Again, we read it. He says, for you put up with one brings you into bondage. That's what these false teachers were doing. They were bringing them into bondage. They were devouring you. They were taking from them. They were exalting themselves above others there. And then they were actually striking them on the face. And Paul says, and you put up with it. 
It seems like they were more than just boastful. They were abusive. They were abusive. And ultimately, they had nothing to sustain their boasting. It was all in false pretense. But Paul then compares his credentials, if you want to look at it that way. Verse 22 through 33, he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? And then he breaks and he says, I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things. What comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I I not weak? Who is made to stumble and do I not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aret as the king was, got, was guarding the city of the Damascenes and with garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. And you can read that story in the book of Acts. So at this point, if I were one of these troublemakers, I would probably be looking for a rock to crawl under. <laughs> they don't have this testimony. They don't have any of this foundation they can call upon. They can't say any of these things. And Paul only put it out there to show that I have been through it. I have lived it. I am who I say I am. What have they got? All they've got is, look at me. And then there's a cricket sound, long pause, because they have nothing else. They have nothing to sustain who they are. In the realm of qualifications, Paul supersedes them all. He supersedes them all. And he could have given them more, as he did in Philippians chapter 3, 4 through 9. It goes on in there. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But this is what it really gets you when you start to see what Paul's heart is. He says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. These I have counted loss. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is in the law, but that which is through Jesus Christ, my faith in Christ, the righteousness of which is from God by faith. Paul came to know what was important. Paul came to understand it isn't about my background. It's not about what I know. It's not about how, how much zeal I had. It's not about all of the things that I earned and my degrees and my, all the letters behind my name. And it's not about any of these things. It's, those, are, those are not bad things, by the way, for those who have worked hard for their degrees. I encourage them in that, and I think that's awesome. But we also know that we don't walk in that. That doesn't identify us. We were talking about that this morning. (laughs) Those letters behind your name do not identify you. The title that you have does not identify you. You're identified as a believer through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. That's how you're identified. You can't put enough letters behind your name to impress Him. But He is our life. But He gave up. His earthly resume. Paul gave up his earthly resume. And before the road to Damascus, if somebody had asked him about himself, he would have rolled out this scroll 
And he would have laid all these things we just read out and he would have been proud in those things and he said, look at who I am. Look at what I know. Look at what I've accomplished. And I'm going out and I'm going to defend God himself by killing all these Christians. That's who he was. But then he went to Damascus. <laughs> Had he only not gone to Damascus, but he did. And he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And when he met Jesus... All of these things that he had earned and all of the distinctions that he had and everything that he thought was important was rubbish. Another term for that is dung, by the way, is how that word is interpreted. The question for us today, what's in our resume? Paul's testimony became his resume. Paul's testimony in Jesus Christ became his resume. It was no longer about who he had been, where he had come from, what he had earned. It was no longer about any of those things. And for us today, we have to ask that question, what is most important to us? What is important to us today? What do we identify ourselves with when we're in the world and we're in relationship with other people what do we present to them? Because I'll be honest with you, I come from a very prideful place. And I struggle with it. Even today, I struggle with it. And I have to be very careful in relationships at work, in relationships with other people, that I don't present the prideful me, but I reckon that dead, so that what I am putting out is Jesus in me. And that's a daily process, by the way. As long as we're in this tent, there's going to be struggles with that. But what is our, what is our resume? What, what are we presenting to other people? Is our education? Is our job? Is our status in society? Or is our position in life more important than our testimony of how Jesus saved us and what He's doing in our lives? What's more important? It reminds me of the Andy Griffith show when the Darlings came to town. And they were trying to find a place. They kept going into a little place, and he, get, he kept getting run off, you know. Andy would knock on the window. And he said, what number did I commit this time? He said, 413, occupying a place without a place, you know, without a license. So he offered him a place to stay in the jail. And the funniest thing, he said, I got a place for you. He said, well, we ain't up for no charity. We want to maintain our social status in society. <laughs> And that's how people are today. They, they don't care. I mean, no matter what they really are, people can sometimes, by the way, they see through our, our pretentiousness. So, but we don't lose our, our, our status in society. So, you know, we want no charity. But let me tell you something. In God, in Him, and in our testimony that He's given us and He's poured in us, none of the other stuff matters. We can come from the poorest place, but we're rich in Him. We can come from the richest place of the world and be considered to be the poorest one, but we're still rich in Him. Because we're not hanging on to the resume of the world. Do we find ourselves sharing our fleshly successes or our spiritual ones? You know, I, I like to run and I like to get medals. And I like to put them in a little box and look at them. You know, I mean, that's, I do. <laughs> But I have to be careful, cause, and the Lord humbled me because I ain't won a medal in a long time. <laughs> and it hurts to run. <laughs> and things change, and your body shuts down. And is my joy in the medal, or is my joy in the fact that God is still allowing me to run? Is God still in me? Is He still giving me the, the, the strength to do these things? Do I find myself wanting to share more about the fleshly successes or the spiritual ones? And I'm going to tell you, and you've already seen the witness of the testimony this week of how God has moved among this body. And God has healed when the sick were there. He's healed the brokenhearted too. He's touching people who are going through some of the most difficult times that most of you don't even know. And He's right there with them. He's got them in the palm of His hand. And you know what's so exciting for me? is when I see the joy in somebody's face and their heart and their testimony when I know what they've shared and I know where they're at and I know what they're going through. 
they don't joy in anything but the Lord. There's an old saying that says, you know, you know, you don't, until Jesus is all you have, you don't realize that he's all you need. And sometimes we all go through those, those seasons, and, and, and we have to come to that point to understand that it is all about him. The scriptures tell us that our reward is not found here. Our, it's not found in earthly treasures. It's not found in what we can build. It's not found in what we can ac accumulate. But it's in heaven for eternity. It's in heaven for eternity. Hebrews 10, 34 30 through 36 says, For you had compassion on me in my change. Now Paul is speaking, or not Paul, I'm saying, I don't, honestly, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. I believe it was probably Paul, but I can't say that for sure. But he says, For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyful accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Do not cast away your confidence. Is our confidence in ourself? Or is our confidence in the Lord? I believe that God is continuing to reveal himself moment by moment and day by day. And I wanted to share something with you. It's, 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 it's an exciting thing for us here at Calvary Chapel River Oaks. Just to show you how God continues to work and how he continues to move. Now, you may look around this morning and you say, well, you've got a lot of empty seats, so why are you even thinking about this? But we've been considering relocating for a while. We've been praying about a relocation. We've been asking God because there are times when these seats, we don't have hardly any left. And, you know, today we have a lot of people out of town and traveling. But it's been kind of tight sometimes. And you, people come in and they have a chair here and a chair there and a chair here. So we've been asking the Lord. So, Lord, we feel like we're tight. We need to move. We need to find a place. And so... You know, we put that before the Lord, and then we begin to keep our eyes open, and we found a place here, and we'd find a place there, and every time, God shut the door. We thought we had a place down the road here, right next to the police station, and it was, I mean, it would have been perfect the whole, after it was built out. <laughs> if you saw it beforehand, you'd say, what in the world are you thinking? It was going to take a lot of work. It was going to take a whole, and we would have had to do most of the work. We would have had to put the money into it. But we went before the Lord and said, Lord, if this is what you want, we're willing to do whatever you want us to do. And it came all the way down to the lease. <laughs> and it just wasn't there. The Lord said, no, we had things that needed to be changed, and they wouldn't change them, and so we walked away. And we said, okay, Lord, obviously that's not your will, so we're going to leave it in your hands. Well, and I'm going to use your name just because, and this is not to puff anybody up, but Eric actually went to Kevin about several weeks ago, and he just threw something out about this property Regarding, you know, what, what about if, if something like this may happen? And then Kevin came and he said, you know, this is not a bad idea. And so we started talking and he talked to, to Jack on the board and we all began to pray about that. And I said, well, let's not let any grass grow up. So I went and talked to the owner of the school and the building here. And as you see, there's no room to grow in this building. There's, there's nowhere to go. They can't take out walls because they need the classrooms. So we said, what if, what if there was another building on the property? What if maybe, you know, we could build another building? And we even talked in the mind thought process about us building a building on the property. They just bought other acreage back here. So they own everything all the way to the corner on the other road behind us. And so, and, and, and so when I went to her and presented it to her, she said, well, you know, it's interesting that you came to me because I've been talking to the builder. We're getting ready to expand. We knew they were talking about what might take place. They were originally going to add on three or four more classrooms, another bathroom to this, this facility. But in that, it really wouldn't have changed what, what our need is because this room really wouldn't have changed, and we still have to set up and break down every week. And it's a challenge for us. So, you know, she said, so that's what they're going to do. But then she came back to me. She said, well, what if we do this? What if we build a separate building on the property? And that would be mainly for y'all's use and have four classrooms downstairs. You could do all this stuff. And... And we talked about it, and the, 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 the rent wasn't quite comfortable. We were praying about it, and we weren't going to reject it. But before we really could even come back to her, she called me back, and she said, we've changed, we had a change of plans. We're not going to add on to this building after all. She said, because to do that is going to put the size of this building over 5,000 square feet, and we have to come back and retrofit the sprinkler system into the whole building. She said, the cost would be too much. 
She says, so we're just going to build a separate building. And it's going to be right back here on the back corner of the property, or back corner of this property. If you go out on the corner, you see how the, the hill goes down. It's going to be a 2,400-square-foot building with a full basement. And we're going to have the sanctuary upstairs. We'll be able to leave it completely set up from now on. Not have to, any more, no more set up and break down. Um, and they're doing the whole thing. We don't have to put any money up front on build out. We don't have to do anything in the building at all, except we'll be actually, she, she's welcomed us to come in and help lay out of the stage because we want to have wiring and everything done and lighting and that kind of stuff. All that she's going to let us work with the builder on. If they can get a fire escape the way they want to set, we'll have 1,800 square feet sanctuary, which doubles the size of this room. If they can't get the fire escape, we'll still have... 1,400 square feet, which is 500 more square feet than what we have in here. It's one and a half times bigger than what we have here. We have a storage room with 100 chairs that God provided for us when we bought these chairs. All of those will be able to go in there. All of those will be able to be remain set up. Our rent was cut down tremendously from what we were going to have to do if they built on here and that. It fit us perfectly to what we felt like the Lord told us we could afford. Everything is done. All we're waiting on is for them to build it. God provided that for us. And we don't have to go in and change our address. We don't have to do anything. Just wait on the Lord. And hear, I mean, this is how God moves. This is how God works. But He does it in His timing. He does it in His plan. So right now, the plan <laughs> is that they, they possibly may start as early as next month. And we may be in the building by spring. If not... God has a plan, <laughs> and it's timing, but it's all pretty much done, and, um, you know, we've negotiated the lease, everything's ready to go, it's just got to be put it, she's going to write it down for us, and we'll, we'll be ready to go, and again, no money up front at all, it's all going to be completely, totally on them, and the, the one final little thing on that, too, is that originally she asked us, I'd need a five-year commitment, which we were willing to do, I mean, you know, Five years is really nothing. We, this is coming up November. We begin our fifth year, by the way. And so it's like, wow, okay, well, we could do that. So I asked her, though, with the plans changing, I said, do you still need a five-year commitment? And this is the heart of the people that, we, that God has placed with us to work here. And, and they have, you know, the building and all the, the landlords that we work with. She said, well, it would be nice to get a five-year commitment. But she said, you know, quite honestly, if you all outgrew it in a year or two, that's fine. An open-ended lease, just like we have here now. God is good. And we're so thankful for Kim and Kevin, the owners of the place, and the, and the pre, uh, principal of the school, and how they, they're doing that. And they're going to grow, too, because they're going to also add a parking area. So we'll have more parking. They're going to use it for more for a turnaround, because they have when they pick up their kids, or the parents pick up their kids, they come in from the road up there, and they back all the way up. They're backed all the way up to Main Street. And so when they add the building, they have dance, obviously you're going to have more kids. So they're going to have it situated. And I don't have the, quite the, the drawings yet, but it's going to come in. They're going to have a parking area that's going to be able to come around. They're going to be able to circle all the way around, and we will have use of their circle area for additional parking. So, again, God's thought it all through. <laughs> he had it all planned out all along. We went through a few things, and Kevin and I kind of chuckle about it. We went through a few rough spots when we're looking for places because... You do get discouraged. You do get to, you, you start talking to people and you think it's going one way and it goes a totally different direction. And that's why you have to always come back to the Lord and say, Lord, we don't want to get wrapped up in that anymore. Forgive me. And I have to ask the Lord, forgive me for getting too pushy over here or driving over here. Put it back before the Lord and he reveals himself over and over and over again. So that's a blessing I wanted to share with you before we part today. Father, we thank you for your hand. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your leading, and we just praise your holy name, Lord, because you are a God who loves your people. And we are a people who are desperate for our God. We love you, Lord. We're dependent upon you. Please don't let us get, get wrapped up into the worldly views of, of what's important in our lives. Please don't let us focus on, on the fleshly, worldly things. But let us lay all those things down so that we can have our resume as our testimony in Jesus Christ. Let people see that. Let that be the presentation that we put out before all people. And we thank you. We glory in your name. We glory in who you are.
and we love you. And it's the precious name of Jesus that I pray. Amen and amen.